Yet McClellan finally was preparing to move. He planned an invasion of Virginia by water, taking his army down the Chesapeake Bay near the mouth of the James River. They would land at Fort Monroe, 70 miles southeast of Richmond, and then move toward the Confederate capital. Whether or not this plan was sound, the execution was problematic. After landing on the Virginia Peninsula, in early April, McClellan and 55,000 troops laid siege to Yorktown. Defending the site were just 13,000 Confederate soldiers, commanded by Major General John Magruder. Though McClellan had an overwhelming numerical superiority, he was convinced that Magruder had far more men. This was aided by Magruder's theatrics, in which he moved men about quickly to create the sense of greater numbers. Though pressed by Lincoln to attack, McClellan dug in and lay siege for a month. During that time, Johnston's forces moved in to support Magruder. And in the end, all of the Confederate forces fell back toward Richmond before McClellan could finally make use of his heavy artillery. A month spent and almost nothing gained. Battle finally occurred in Williamsburg, where 32,000 Confederates under Major General James Longstreet fought a delaying action against 41,000 Union troops under Brigadier General Joseph Hooker. The Union troops were eventually able to push back the Confederates and claim victory. But the fighting in Williamsburg had allowed the bulk of the Confederate forces to reach Richmond in time to defend it against the invading forces. By late May, McClellan's Army of the Potomac had advanced to the outskirts of Richmond. At a little spot just south of the Chickahominy River, known as Seven Pines, his forces would be temporarily halted by the bloodiest battle to date in the Eastern Theater of the War. Confederate General Joseph Johnston developed a complex plan in which 51,000 of his men would strike McClellan's second and third corps, about 33,000 troops. Implementation of the plan proved difficult, and though the Union advance was slowed, the Confederates took heavy casualties. Both sides claimed victory, though both suffered significant losses. The Union took 5,000 casualties, including almost 800 killed, 3,600 wounded, and over 600 missing or captured. But the Confederates were hit even harder, with almost 1,000 killed and almost 5,000 wounded, plus 400 captured or missing. McClellan spent the next three weeks entrenching and regrouping, settling in for a long siege of Richmond. On the Confederate side, General Johnston had been wounded in action, and a new leader of the Southern forces emerged. A man whose aggressive tactics were the precise opposite of McClellan's excessive caution, and who would build a name for himself that would long survive the war and all its participants. A man named Robert E. Lee. While McClellan spent the next weeks preparing to lay siege, Lee spent the time preparing to strike. From June 25th to July 1st, 1862, there was a brutal series of battles outside of Richmond, which brought McClellan's Peninsula Campaign to an ignominious end. On the 25th, the Union gained a Pyrrhic victory in the Battle of Oak Grove where they gained a mere 600 yards of ground at the cost of almost 70 dead and 500 wounded versus a similar death toll, but fewer wounded among the Confederates. This minor battle was the only actual offensive strike against Richmond during the campaign. Over the next several days, Lee's army struck at McClellan repeatedly. In battles at Beaver Dam Creek, Gaines Mill, Garnet and Golding's Farm, Savage's Station, and Glendale. Lee's assaults had limited success in damaging McClellan's forces, but they did succeed 
in pushing the Army of the Potomac back and back further from Richmond. The final fight occurred on July 1st at the Battle of Malvern Hill. Union forces that day were commanded by Major General Fitz John Porter. Lee had prepared another complex plan of attack, but muddy roads and poor maps prevented the coordinated effort that was required to succeed. General Porter later described the action of that day. About 10 a.m., the enemy's skirmishers and artillery began feeling us along our line. They kept up a desultory fire until about 12 o'clock with no severe injury to our infantry, who were well masked and who revealed but little of our strength or position by retaliatory firing or exposure. The spasmatic, though sometimes formidable, attacks of our antagonists at different points along our whole front up to about 4 o'clock were presumably demonstrations or feelers to ascertain our strength preparatory to their engaging in more serious work. At about 5.30 o'clock, as column after column advanced, only to meet the same disastrous repulse, the sight became one of the most interesting imaginable. The havoc made by the rapidly bursting shells from guns arranged so to sweep any position far or near and in any direction was fearful to behold. Pressed to the extreme as they were, the courage of our men were fully tried. The safety of our army, the life of the Union, was felt to be at stake. In one case, the brigades of Howe, Abercrombie, and Palmer of Couch's division, under impulse, gallantly pushed after the retreating foe, captured colors, and advantageously advanced the right of the line, but a considerable loss and great risk. The brigades of Morrill, cool, well-disciplined, and easily controlled, let the enemy return after each repulse, but permitted a few to escape their fire. I sent messages to the commanding general expressing the hope that our withdrawal had ended and that we should hold the ground now occupied, even if we did not assume the offensive. It was now after 9 o'clock at night I received orders to withdraw and to move at specified hours to Harrison's Landing. One should never forget that these battles took place on roads, fields, and woods near the homes of civilian families trying to survive while the world exploded around them. Edward Neal was a chaplain with the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment at the Battle of Malvern Hill. He described one family's experience. When night came, I slept on a sofa in the West House. The person who seemed to be the head of the household was a gentle, manly man, but greatly worried by the eruption of an invading army trampling down his crops. Before the morning, the 1st of July, Sumner's Corps reached Malvern Hill from Glendale and was posted on the right of the Union Army. About 8 o'clock, Confederate artillery took position in a wheat field on the Poindexter Farm and opened fire. The shells bursting near the West House. The family, with some of their neighbors, in consternation fled into the cellar, to which there was access to a large outside door. The Confederate assault at Malvern Hill failed to gain ground against the Union troops, whose position was nearly impregnable. The rebels never got within 200 yards of the main Union line. Union artillery tore the Confederates apart as wave after wave of rebels continued to attack. Lee's men took over 5,600 casualties compared with 2,100 for the Army of the Potomac. However, despite achieving victory in the battle, McClellan withdrew to Harrison's Landing on the James River where his army could be protected by Union gunboats. McClellan informed the president that Richmond could not be taken at this time, and they returned north. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.